you know, to the first speaker for the morning session. So Phil Bedard, who uh, is an associate professor at the University of Toronto. He uh, leads uh, the cancer genomics program. Um, and he's going to talk to us about immune checkpoint and co-stimulatory molecules beyond PD-1 and PD-L1. Phil? Great. Thanks, Elaine, for the introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, so my disclosures are all related to industry funding for clinical trials. So I think uh, Mario really set the stage well in terms of the rest of the day and some of where this talk fits in. Really thinking about the future of immunotherapy beyond sort of PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4, really the goal of looking at different immune combinations for me as a simplistic uh, non-immunologist to phase one oncologist is really trying to generate higher response rates, so more patients who actually develop response from treatment with immunotherapy, more durable responses. Certainly we have you know, examples of patients who have prolonged disease control, but there are also many others who have relatively brief durations of disease control with a response to the immunotherapy agents that are in the clinic. And um, you know, one of the things, of course, is with the CTLA-4 and, and PD-1, PD-L1 combination, uh, the concerns around toxicity, particularly high-grade toxicities, which can be life-threatening. So potentially having combinations that are as active or more active with improved tolerability and fewer safety concerns. So um, this is the randomized study, Checkmate 67, with in first-line melanoma, looking at the combination uh, versus uh, single-agent nivolumab. Uh, and you can see, as, as Mary has sort of alluded to, that there's a higher response rate, sort of more durable responses in these patients. The concern, of course, as he alluded to, is the rate of high-grade adverse events, particularly with regards to colitis, which occurs in about 20 20% of patients or so treated with a combination that can be life-threatening, can lead to perforation, can lead to multi-organ failure, hepatitis, uh, and also skin rash, which can be really problematic in some of these patients who are treated. And so thinking of it simplistically from the point of view of Kaplan-Meier curves, what we really want to do with combinations is to try and sort of push up the curves and have a longer tail on the curve so there are more patients, uh, even with widely metastatic disease, who have prolonged disease control. And so there's a variety of ways that this can be done. Um, as a sort of simplistic non-immunologist, you know, there's different green lights in terms of things that activate the immune systems, red lights, things that put brakes on the immune system. And finding ways to try and fine tune that and finding what the right mix is for an individual patient is really the focus of most of the studies that we're participating in at the present point in time. And so this was a review article that was recently published in Clinical Cancer Research. I think it's a nice sort of schematic. It's obviously a simplification of what occurs and what we've seen so far in terms of patients who, who benefit from immunotherapies and patients who don't. But they sort of divide it up into three different categories of patients. And so patients where you can see that there's some active immune response that's ongoing in the tumor, but it's, it's sort of not, it's not all the way there. And you need some additional push, like an immune checkpoint inhibitor, to try and push those patients, their immune system over the edge so that they can benefit. Then there are patients who you can see immune cells, but they're sort of lined up at the gate. They're not able to penetrate, get into the tumor, and, and result in, in tumor control. And so those might be the types of patients where if you think about manipulating signals like activation signals or checkpoints or giving those in combination, you might be able to open the gates and allow the immune cells to, to have a better and more durable response in terms of the cancer. And then there are those patients where really you see nothing that's going on at the level of the immune system. They're, they're immunologically ignorant, they're inert, and you need some sort of spark. And I think we'll hear about some of that from some of the other speakers today in terms of something to generate an immune response. And then perhaps with uh, combinations of co-stimulatory molecules and immune checkpoint inhibitors, we might be able to, to take that spark in terms of what you can generate in terms of an immune response and, and make it a, a more durable type of situation where you, you get a sustained immune response in those tumors. And so there are a variety of different signals. Some of these are in the clinic that are being tested with different combinations, both in terms of activating signals and also in terms of inhibitory signals. So I wanted to go through a few, some of the emerging data that's been generated in the last six months or a year in terms of some of these combinations together with PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors that have been looked at in the clinic. This was a study that was presented by Tony Tolcher at ASCO, uh, looking at a 4-1 BB inhibitor, etolimumab. It's, uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister, uh, in combination uh, with avalumab. So uh, as uh, Mario alluded to, 4-1 BB is an important sort of immune agonist, presents an activation type of signals uh, for T cells. And in this study, what I think is 
is, is going to be uh, an emerging theme from some of the data that we have in the clinic, is that if you looked at this combination together with pembrolizumab at full dose, really there wasn't, there wasn't the same safety signal that was seen with the CTLA-4 uh, and PD-1 combination. You know, the rate of grade 3, 4 adverse events was very similar to what we see with PD-1 or PDL uh, PDL one monotherapy alone on the order of about 5 to 10%. And so uh, one of the big challenges is that although there was some activity that was seen in this study, you can see that there were complete and partial responses seen in a sort of smattering of different cancers, including kidney cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer, we're really at an early stage. We're talking about studies that are looking at dose escalation with small expansion cohorts, where there's a mixed basket of patients. Many of these patients hadn't received prior immune therapy. And we know that PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors are, are active in some of these patients on their own. So trying to tease out whether or not there's a true go signal in terms of looking at the combination and figuring out which patients to do a larger randomized study is going to be one of the big challenges in the field. Um, one of the studies that we participated in here in our phase one group, which was presented uh, by my colleague Aaron Hansen at ACR, was looking at an OX40 agonist developed by Genentech. So this is another activating signal, um, looking at it in monotherapy. And so doses were tested up to 1,200 milligrams, looking at pharmacodynamic effects in, in peripheral T cells. You saw saturation at the receptor at doses as low as 40 milligrams, and 300 milligrams was selected as the dose to take forward for additional combination studies. Really, in the monotherapy study, not much was seen in terms of adverse events. Uh, there were a couple of patients with kidney cancer who responded uh, to monotherapy. Uh, and what was interesting, and I think is an emerging theme in the field, is that in this study, while the phase one was ongoing with monotherapy, there was a parallel study, which we also participated in, that looked at the combination of the OX40 agonist uh, together with the tezolizumab, a PDL1 inhibitor. So even before we had the safety profile that was well established for the monotherapy, combination data was already being generated. And this was presented uh, by Jeff Infante uh, at uh, the ASCO meeting this year. Again, this study which we participated in. A number of patients were treated across a variety of different tumor types. And somewhat reassuringly, the combination of OX40 together with a tezolizumab, a PDL1, we didn't really see any sort of alarming signals in terms of safety. The, the profile was very similar to what we would expect with the tezolizumab alone in terms of the rate of high-grade adverse events. And this is the spider plot. It's a bit of a busy slide. The messages from this slide are <clears throat> there were a couple of patients who had response. Uh, one patient with bladder cancer treated at the lowest dose of OX40 with the flat dose of atezolizumab. Another patient who was treated on OX40 monotherapy who then rolled over and was treated with the combination. Um, and there were some patients who had had prior exposure to PD-1, PD-L1. Those are indicated with the dots on this slide. And the difficulty from these types of studies, you know, the data needs to mature, we need more time, we need more patients who are treated, is that it's sort of hard to know what to make of this. You know, the, the activity is not overwhelming, although it's a bit of a mixed basket, but it's hard to know exactly whether or not, you know, adding an agonist like OX40 clearly has a, a, a synergistic type of effect in these patients. More recently at the SITSI meeting, there was some data that was presented from Bristol-Myers Squibb with their anti-Kir antibody, lirolimumab, together with nivolumab. So Kir uh, is an inhibitory receptor that's on NK cells. And so this particular study involved a variety of different expansion cohorts. They presented data with their expansion cohort in squamous cell cancer of the head and neck, where it's known that um, Kir is highly expressed and there's a sort of higher infiltrate of NK cells leading to the hypothesis that the combination may be more active uh, in this disease. And so this is the safety data from this study that was presented. And um, the cohort of patients uh, treated with um, uh, squamous cell cancer of the head and neck was relatively small. But again, there was no real clear uh, alarming type of safety signal. The, the rate of grade 3, 4 adverse events was relatively low in this population of patients treated with full dose nivolumab. Um, Oops, I think I skipped the waterfall plot, but the bottom line was that uh, in this particular study, the rate of response was 26%. We know with PD-1, PD-L monotherapy alone in head and neck cancer, the rate is on the order of 10 to 15 to 20%. So again, reassuring, interesting data, but not a real clear signal that, that the combination together in these highly selected patients provides some additional activity. IDEO is an interesting target looking at immune combinations. So uh, really IDEO is an enzyme that's involved in the microenvironment, also expressed in antigen presenting cells, which depletes tryptophan and leads to a sort of more inhibitory microenvironment for the effect of, of T cells. So there are a variety of IDEO inhibitors that are in the clinic. 
Most of these are oral drugs that can be given to patients, uh, unlike some of the other data with the OX40 agonists, with the 41BB, with lirolimumab, which are intravenous. And um, so this is an ongoing study with pacodostat <laughs> in addition to pembrolizumab. So, um, this data was presented at ESMO earlier this year, uh, looking specifically in terms of the combination with pembrolizumab. The rate of grade three, four adverse events was again relatively low. Rash was about 18 percent, uh, was 8 percent, 18 percent of all grade three, four adverse events in this population. Uh, and although the numbers are small, the activity in treatment naive melanoma patients was quite interesting. The response rate was on the order of 53%. And this has led to a, a randomized study in the first line setting uh, that's ongoing in patients with melanoma. And also you can see, even though the numbers are small, that there was activity seen with this combination in a variety of other cancer types. Again, hard to know what to make of it with small numbers when PD-1 or PD-L1 monotherapy is, is active in, in some of these patients to a low degree uh, on its own. And so this is another uh, IDO inhibitor that's also in the clinic. This has been tested with a variety of different PD-1 as well as CTLA-4 inhibitors. This was a poster that was presented at ASCO. I think it's a little bit hard to read on the slide. Uh, but it's interesting that the response rate, again, in this melanoma treatment naive population was very similar on the order of 50% of or so, including three patients who had complete responses that seemed to be durable. So um, I like this slide, it's a busy slide, but I think it does sort of illustrate you know, the flurry of activity that's ongoing in the field. So if you look at all of these different targets uh, and where they are in terms of development and then the industry sponsor, you can see that there's a lot of activity, a lot of different drugs that are being tested in combination with PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors. Most of these immune combinations are in the phase one or early phase two setting. So I think we'll see a lot of data over the next six to 18 months in terms of knowing sort of how to interpret this data and move forward and which combinations to prioritize uh, for further development. So um, just to sort of highlight, uh, you know, we've certainly had a number of studies that are going on in this space as well. So taking a look at this particular slide, I've just sort of highlighted some of the studies that we have that are ongoing in our phase one program, both in terms of looking at co-stimulatory molecules together with PD-1 or PD-L1, uh, as well as, as checkpoint inhibitors and other uh, inhibitory targets. So there's a lot of activity that's going on in the field, and, and we have a lot of studies that are going on uh, for these patients as well. So in terms of take-home messages, this is my last slide. I think you know, it's reassuring that PD-1 and PD-L1 is safe. It's a good backbone. We know that it has, has some single activity in a broad range of different tumor types. The early data with some of these immune combinations, at least with 4-1-BB, with IDO, OX40, and with Cure, suggests that you know, we don't see the same degree of grade 3, 4 adverse events that we've seen with CTLA-4 uh, and with PD-1, PD-L1. But the big challenge, I think, for us as early phase trial investigators is really trying to figure out from these small expansion cohorts with highly selected patients whether or not there's true synergistic activity with these combinations and what to take forward for additional randomized studies. And you know, truth be told, you know, there's more rational combinations than we can really test in terms of patient resources uh, and resources from a clinical trials point of view. So we really need to be smart in terms of trying to figure out which combinations we should prioritize and which combinations shouldn't go further. And I think we're not far away from, from the point where we'll have triple combinations uh, and maybe even beyond looking at immune checkpoints and co-stimulatory molecules, which is going to be even more of a challenge to sort of keep track of and figure out what the activity is. Thanks for your attention. Great. Thanks, Phil. We have, um, we have time for one burning question. And if there are no burning questions, we will save all the burning questions to the panel. So. With that, thank you. You're going to come back.